Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our investing podcast. Our guest on the podcast today is Matthew Voita, founder and chief information officer and investment officer of Amtelon Capital, a mutual fund focused on Iranian equities. Amtelon comes from Amsterdam, Tehran, and London. His fund gives Western investors like you and me access to profitable businesses with low debt and valuations from one of the countries with the youngest population and great demographics. Iran's stock market is dominated by retail investors with foreign ones making up less than half a percent of the market cap. Voital looks for companies that have pure export exposure and tries to avoid companies that are affected by U.S. sanctions using a bottom-up approach, uh, but also with his strong uh, macro back background. Matthew has also experience working with J.P. Morgan at the Equity Derivatives Group, an internal hedge fund within the bank. Matthew, uh, welcome to our podcast. I'm very glad that we have the chance to discuss about investment opportunities in Iran. Hi, Victor. Thank you very much for having me. To begin with, your investing motto says that delivering above average returns requires a higher than average level of curiosity. Can you explain how that is possible to find better risk reward opportunities, given that worldwide investors believe in the efficient market hypothesis? Yes, of course. Um, look, it may work. Efficient markets could work um, if you know many assumptions are met, and all the obvious assumptions are not met in Iran because we are focused on Iran. This is the country that is very, very difficult to access. Um, even if you look globally at different markets, developed markets, emerging markets, frontier markets. You know, markets like, you know, from Vietnam to some sub-Saharan Africa, somewhere far away in Southeast Asia, if there is like a genuine good opportunity there is, that is mispriced, you know, foreign capital will find its way, right? And will flow there, will go there to, to arbitrage this opportunity. With Iran, it's different because most of the money in the world cannot touch Iran. Why? Because most of the money is coming from the U.S., And U.S. has sanctions that say that American investors can cannot do any business or any investments in Iran. That's why the um, possibility of finding a genuinely mispriced opportunity is much bigger in a country like Iran than anywhere else in the world. What do you think about uh, the current valuations of the global stock market? And where do you see the best uh, investing opportunities for the next decade? And more specifically, which are the most interesting uh, emerging markets that you would consider for the very long term? Look, Victor, I'm obviously biased because I decided to focus on Iran and, and specifically because uh, I think Iran is the most uh, uh, you know, compelling market for the next decade. But I'll tell you why. Um, look, when you look at global markets, When you look at two things, um, the phase of the economic cycle, whether it's an early expansion phase or is it a mature cycle, I think we are in a mature cycle, um, uh, which means that you're you know, probably closer to the end of this expansionary cycle than to the beginning of the cycle, right? Then when you look at the, at the valuations uh, of the global markets, especially developed markets or markets like the U.S., um, you're really paying top valuations, like very often record high valuations for those assets. So the situation that you have is that you're buying assets that produce some profits at potentially th the top of the economic cycle, which means that those profits, profit margins and everything are potentially the highest they can. And on top of that, you're paying the highest multiple, valuation multiple, on those uh, you know, peak earnings, potentially. Well, I'm not sure about that. No one is, but potentially this is the situation, right? 
Then emerging markets could be different. A lot of emerging markets have better valuations now. But when you go, go and look at Iran, you look at where the economy is at the moment. It's coming out of recession. There was you know, a couple of years in recession because of uh, the US sanctions that were imposed by the previous US administration. Um, so um, what, 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 this, what did uh, these sanctions mean? Um, exporters couldn't export easily because um, you know, it's not easy to, to buy Iranian products. Uh, it's not easy to ship them to South Korea or to Japan because those sanctions are just making it very difficult. Even if you find the buyer, then arranging the payment or the, or the logistics or the insurance, right? It's very difficult, which means that it's very expensive, right? So, you know, the volumes that they're exporting are lower than they could be. And also um, the margins that they're getting are lower because they have to incentivize the buyer with, you know, price discounts and then, uh, you know, the transaction costs eat into their margins as well. So, you know, so this is one uh, thing that sanctions cost, but also they cost inflation. Inflation is uh, because they cost, obviously, the currency to go down, which um, uh, caused the inflation to go up. And inflation is hitting households the most. So the average consumer in Iran was getting hit by inflation really hard over the last couple of years. And his real purchasing power is, is, is really at the bottom. So he's just consuming you know, the essential goods. So, and this is the picture of Iran, right? So all the profits that those companies are making are really at the bottom of the cycle. Uh, and many of those companies are still, still very profitable. But these are not some elevated, you know, top of the cycle profits. No, it's quite the contrary, right? Bottom of the cycle, the country is coming out of recession. They are right now, we can talk about it in a moment, um, um, negotiating in Vienna, Iran is negotiating with the US, with Europe, China, Russia to lift those sanctions. If this happens, and we are hearing that it will happen potentially sooner than, than we expected, um, well, the, the, the economy will probably be growing at the fastest rate in the world, right, or among the fastest rates in the world for the next couple of years. Um, so, so, so this is why, why I like Iran, because of its, let's say, place uh, in the economic um, cycle, but also, you know, uh, interest rates. In the developed world, went to zero or below zero, and will most likely only get higher from here. Right? It's already happening in the U.S. Um, at least that's the ret rhetoric that we are hearing. In in Iran, interest rates are at twenty two percent, or at least you know the the yields on on treasury short term tre treasury bills. Um, so the yields are likely, together with inflation, to go down. Inflation before sanctions was at ten percent. Uh, there is no reason why it, why it shouldn't go back to where it was. Then interest rates will be also going down. And what, what that means? Well, that means a couple of things. First of all, for businesses, uh, for consumers, it will be possible to, to take debt, to, 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 to get access to leverage. Because, you know, if you can finance your investment or, you know, at 30%, it's very difficult, right? Try getting a mortgage at 30%, right? Forget about this, right? But if, if, if those, that's why no one has any debt, any meaningful uh, amount of debt. But if interest rates go down significantly, um, this will, um, uh, this can kickstart like the whole credit growth, which hasn't happened in Iran yet. And this will be one of the drivers of growth in the, in, in the future. So this is one thing. But also lower interest rates will mean that investors will start thinking about different asset classes. Right now, people, you know, many people in Iran are happy to just um, buy treasury bills and get this 20% um, um, yield, uh, uh, which didn't make sense anyway, because the currency was depreciating at a faster rate, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, this is one of the reasons why equity valuations were low, um, but now they got even lower. Um, and uh, with, you know, interest rates going, going down in the future, this will help the stock market. But the final, the final argument why I think Iran is the most exciting place to be for the next you know, decade um, are the valuations of, of the stock market. Um, when you look at the overall market, let's say top 100 companies, 
So by the way, you have 600 companies listed on the exchange. People don't know that, right? It's Iran. No one has ever heard of it. Many people mix up, you know, the name of Iran with Iraq and all those countries in the region start with I, right? I mean, it's ridiculous, but people, the level of knowledge uh, about, about the region and, and especially about Iran is very, very low. Um, so Iran has functioning capital markets. You have 600 stocks listed, uh, market cap of, of around $250 billion. Daily trading value is around $200 million, right? It's a proper market that once it gets integrated in the global financial system, it, you know, every emerging market fund out there will be investing on this market, right? So <clears throat> you have this big market with a lot of liquidity, everything driven by retail investors, which has you know, good and bad things about it because it makes it very inefficient, which is good for, for professional investors like us because it's easier to find opportunities. But at the same time, it takes longer for those opportunities to crystallize, you know, to, to things start working as they should, right? The market can, can be, you know, irrational for, for longer because it's driven by retail investors. Anyway, so you have this big market that is well diversified across 50 different industries. So, you know, oil and gas is not listed there, right? So, so it's really good exposure to the whole economy. And the valuations are around you know, three times earnings, four times earnings, five times earnings, six times earnings, depend on the industry. But the for top 100 companies, we estimate that the forward PE, um, so price over the next year's earnings or the current year's earnings, um, is less than five. It's around four and a half. Many companies pay more than 20% dividend yields. Uh, and this is very important because, you know, dividends... Uh, dividends uh, verify uh, the earnings, the, the accounting numbers, right? One thing is to just read, okay, how much, what were the profits of the company, you know, last year? And they say, okay, fine, we have, we have the audited financial statement. But, you know, in emerging markets, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not that easy, right? It could, be still, it could be still a fraud, right? But when they say that they made, you know, an X amount of profits, and then they pay out 90% of it as dividend. Well, this is real money that, that goes into your account. So this is good to, you know, to verify, to validate, let's say, the numbers that, uh, that you see in the financial statements. So the payout ratios are traditionally, have traditionally been very high in Iran. That's why those dividend yields are super high. I mean, we are right now holding, you know, one company that is, um, you know, benefiting a lot from high fertilizer prices across across the world they have good access to to natural gas and, and they are exporting uh, urea uh, they are at you know five times earnings and we are about to get 17 percent dividend um, uh, yield on on, on the stock i mean you know it it, it, it it doesn't get much better than that to be honest in uh, with, with, with with simple with simple investment strategies, right? We are basically bottom bottom up stock picking um, in a market that is um, that is dominated by retail, and that, that's why it gives you so many opportunities. Sorry, it's a long long answer to your question. Thank you very much. Yes, Larry Swedrow usually says that dividends are return of capital, not return on capital. However, I think it's important uh, to uh, earn dividends in markets where you don't trust corporate uh, governance, uh, let's say. Uh, and now, um, speaking about uh, cheap markets and uh, expensive markets, uh, how much is Iranian CAPE ratio right now? Sorry, say again? Uh, Iranian CAPE ratio, so the cyclic adjusted price. Uh, the CAPE ratio. I couldn't um, find this information on the internet. Look, CAPE, because no one probably calculates um, uh, CAPE for Iran. So uh, I didn't do it myself. So I would have to, you know, take a guess. Um, but long term, well, you know, the, 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 the ratios that I have that I know is that the the long term trailing p for iran is around you know last 20 years is around 7 um and forward p if you go back and just back out forward p from historical 
uh, numbers, um, you know, it's around five. Um, so now the valuations went to below of the of the historical, you know, forward P valuations. Now CAPE, I would have to, you know, you would have to some uh, add up, you know, the the the, the long term long term earnings. Mm, it's also probably you would need to adjust them because you know Iran is a high inflationary country, so it's usually better to measure things in dollars, right? It just um, shows you after the the effect of inflation is included. If you were to choose, let's say, one single valuation metric to decide where to invest, uh, which would that be? Uh, so that to let's say avoid value traps, uh, we have Cape price to cash flow, price to earnings, but they are also very volatile, book to market, dividend yield, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it's a number of things. I mean, we uh, we usually look, you know, in, in Iran, things are quite simple um, in terms of investing. It's like you're back in the 1990s, right? And uh, with all the knowledge that you've accumulated, you don't really have to go for very, you know, sophisticated or... Uh, uh, complex uh, valuation match metrics. Um, I'm happy with uh, price to net earnings because net earnings, you know, show me everything that is included. Um, and uh, and and we also look for companies that we believe will grow. So we like the 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 future EPS growth, um, and um, and we look at forward P basically, right? So forward P is what we're interested in, right? So so first we look at uh, the potential for earnings growth, uh, and then and then we basically look for companies that have, you know, the smallest forward P, and that works. Matthew, I would like to tell us about uh, your uh, exciting uh, story. Uh, when have you first visited Tehran? And uh, how have you discovered this amazing investing opportunity? Ah, uh, right. So I got interested in Iran in 2016. Um, I, you know, had never traveled to Iran. I had never met an Iranian in my life, so I was completely with without any bias. Right. I just I just read about um, the Iran nuclear deal that was negotiated by the Obama administration with Iran in 2015. In January 2016, it was implemented. The stock market rallied very quickly, 30%. Um, the biggest car manufacturers rallied like, you know, almost 200%. So something was going on. I realized, I started reading about this. I knew that there was a stock market, but I had no idea that it was such a, you know, diverse, liquid, uh, deep uh, stock market. So at that time, it was around, it was trading around $100 million per day. So pretty decent uh, for a country, for a market that no one has ever heard of, right? Uh, with lots of uh, stocks listed, uh, many different industries. So um, I, uh, you know, at some point in, in 2016, it was the first half of 2016, I, I, I told my wife that uh, I bought a ticket to Tehran and I'm flying next weekend. Um, and I just flew there without knowing anyone over there. So I just arranged meetings with uh, the local brokers and local banks, went there, um, opened bank accounts and brokerage accounts for myself um, to be able to test everything with my own money. Then I managed to transfer. Banks were not working at that time. So I somehow, through some intermediaries, you know, transferred like, you know, 5,000 pounds just to test if it's actually working. I started buying some, you know, utility companies that were paying more than 20% dividend yields. I mean, and it was all, all working. So I was there in Tehran. Uh, I had my meetings. After the meetings, I was completely by myself because I didn't know anyone at that time. So, you know, I was going to restaurants by myself. People were asking me uh, where I was from. Um, I said Poland. And um, um, there is some connection between his historical connection between Poland and Iran. Um, so, and also they are very much into, you know, movie industry. So those waiters were asking me about Kieślowski, Polański, so the Polish film directors. One guy actually started speaking to me in Esperanto because uh, because the Esperanto language was invented by a Polish Jew. So he assumed that you know people in Poland can know some Esperanto at least, right? And that was his hobby. So it was all you know 
<laughs> super interesting because this was showing you the quality of people that you were that you were meeting and 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 this is the most i think long term exciting part about Tehran is that population people are the are the biggest the most exciting resource in Iran not the oil and gas obviously they have a lot of it you know all the mining resources people you have 86 million Iranians in 20 years you will have 100 million Iranians average age is 30 years um the education levels so tertiary education like university education levels are at similar rates to western Europe or western countries not the emerging markets they you know it's Iran. It's uh, five thousand years of history, right? Ancient Persia and everything, and 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 they have, they understand this. You can feel from 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 the people that you're interacting with that you know the the they're proud of their history, of their very rich culture. Education is very important. At the same time, they are super friendly, very open. Um, they don't have many tourists there, right? So they are not. Um, fed up with all those tourists around, you know, walking around. So when they, when they see a tourist, they're actually very curious. When they speak English, they will just, you know, approach you and have a chat with you. Um, they're also, it's a also very tolerant society. So, uh, you know, I, I, I was very surprised to learn that in Iran, which, in, which is, you know, an Islamic republic, so it's a Muslim country, but at the same time, you have the biggest Jewish diaspora in the region is in Iran. You have um, uh, Christian, uh, Catholic, Orthodox churches, Zoroastrian churches. So everyone is doing his own thing in terms of faith and religion, and 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 it's and it's and it's okay and it's safe. Um, actually, um, uh, there are minority, um, so there are guaranteed places in the Iranian parliament for the religious minorities. So at least uh, there will always be at least one seat for the Jewish minority, for the Christian minority, for the Zoroastrian minority, which, which you know, shows you again that there are a lot of misconceptions about Iran, right? When you, when you read newspapers, it's usually, usually about politics, right? The regime is this or that, right? Oh, it's a country of, you know, I don't know, uh, that is supporting terrorists and so on. Well, obviously, there are many, many issues over there, like in many other countries, uh, some, some of them worse, some of them uh, better. Um, but there is much more to it, and uh, and 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 many many of those um, in many of this information about Iran are just pure misconceptions uh, because you know the people are actually quite amazing. So so yeah, so that was my 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 experience in 2016. I uh, then decided to focus entirely entirely on Iran. So it was the first time in my career when I decided to focus on one single <clears throat> market and one single country. Now we have an office in Tehran uh, with two full-time analysts. We are hiring more people, um, and uh, no, we're 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 only getting more involved because you know when I walk around Tehran, it reminds me so much of Eastern Europe in the nineties. You know, I remember Warsaw from the nineties uh, or Poland from the nineties. It was chaotic. You know, it was uh, you know it was changing from one broken system to something that was more like capitalism but in the meantime you know there were no established institutions right it was corruption it was you know it was chaos right but at the same time in this chaos it was growing like crazy right it was just this entrepreneurial spirit of you know western europeans uh, was released and it was just driving the economy so 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 strongly and uh, and this is what would happen in Iran. I see I see the same you know the same thing that people who who, who are working who are smart and and want to do things. So they they've really been hurt by being under sanctions for pretty much twenty years, last twenty years or maybe forty years, some sort of sanctions. Um, and if this opens up, uh, you know I'm 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 super excited about you know the prospects for the local economy. Uh, by the way, I have been working uh, for a short uh, period uh, for a local bank in the compliance uh, department. And I remember that we had uh, uh, know your customer rules that were setting a red flag for Iranian citizens, which were considered uh, somehow potential threats. And uh, I'm wondering why is that on an ex-ante basis? Because it doesn't seem very politically correct. Let's say. <laughs> yes, bank compliance departments are more strict 
uh, and more ridiculous than international law, right? So because there were, you know, a couple of banks like uh, HSBC or some other big banks that were, uh, uh, or Deutsche Bank, right, were violating basically a lot of rules, right? Uh, Anti-money laundering rules, sanctions rules, and so on. And they were doing this for profit. And then they were fine. So they received like billions of dollars of penalties. So now, the, and, 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 and also not only that, they paid this, but they also promised to have, you know, strong compliance systems in place, right? So this is, this is why they are so, um, so n- not even strict, but they, they uh, just oh, too much of this is going on. But, but with regard to, to, to the Iranians, I mean, you know, I know many Iranians. There is a big Iranian diaspora in many countries, in the UK, Switzerland, Canada, US, and so on. So many of them have problems with banks. Even people that were born in the UK, never been to Iran, actually, but they have an Iranian name and Iranian parents, right? And their accounts are getting closed because they sound Iranian, right? I mean, their, their name sounds Iranian. And the system just flags, uh, you know, screens for, you know, certain parameters, and, and then shuts down the account, and the bank doesn't even have to tell you why it shut down your account, right? This is absolutely, you know, in, 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 in incredible and shouldn't be acceptable, but this is how it is. Yeah, but they are not a sexual minority, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's too bad, yeah. <laughs> um, now, if we think about the alternatives we have as retail investors, uh, what kind of local brokers let's say, offer trading services for international investors in Tehran? And can you invest online as well, or you have to go there in person to open a brokerage account? Do you also have access to data for these companies or not? Yeah, look, the biggest retail broker in Iran is called Mofid Securities. But to open an account, this is a well very complicated process. So first of all, you need a bank account. To open a bank account, not only you need to go to Iran, but you need to convince the bank to to give you a non-resident bank account, which is very, very difficult these days. For me in 2016 and 17, doing the whole setup was much easier than it is right now. Hopefully it will change. But for now, if you go to to Iranian banks and they they will most likely not open an account for you. If they do, then the next step is to get the trading code, which is like a license um, from the regulator. And then with the bank and the trading code, you are able to open the brokerage account. So this is, you know, step number three, not step step number one. And then you actually have to find a way of um, uh, transferring money in a secure way at the at the good exchange rate, not some, you know, um, uh, not some... Um, uh, you know, exchange rate that, that you shouldn't be using because you lose money, basically. So, um, so it's a complicated process, right? So you really have to have big investment in mind to 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 go and do all this work, you know, to to be able to to, to set up um, and invest. Um, 